Good afternoon. You're on the air with uh, David O. You're in the know with David O. Uh, I hope you've had a great week, and we are back now um, for another show. Listen, uh, this week we're going to hear from Professor Craig Green. He's a law professor at Temple's Beasley uh, School of Law, and uh, he's going to be talking about today's Supreme Court. I know many people are like, wow, that's a very boring topic. No, 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 it's not. Uh, it's a very exciting topic and uh, one that I think you will be very surprised uh, to to learn about, uh, surprised not only by the facts, but also surprised at how interesting uh, you find the entire topic. Uh, Professor Craig Green uh, delivers um, this important knowledge in just a very entertaining and clear manner. Uh, and then we'll be hearing from Renee Wall. She is a uh, Nashville singer-songwriter. She had some time here in Philly. That's where I met her. Uh, really fantastic background um, outside of music as well as in music. And she will be uh, performing live as well as uh, you will sample some of her music. And then we're going to talk to Justin Nordell. He is uh, the executive director of the Philadelphia Folk Song Society. And this is the 56th year that the Philadelphia Folk Festival will be playing right in our area. And, uh, you know, it's an internationally known folk festival and uh, really the oldest continuous running and one of the biggest and really something that uh, really brings such great talent. But what makes it all so special? Well, we're going to talk to Justin and find out. But right now, let me thank my sponsors. Uh, starting with uh, Weinerman Pain and Wellness. Uh, they do a fantastic job in uh, helping those who have been injured return to a full life or as full a life as possible. And so many times when you are not physically well, you are not emotionally or mentally well. And so that's an important job. They do a wonderful, uh, they do wonderful work. I visited their place and uh, I thank them, uh, of course, for sponsoring this show, which uh, brings uh, all my wonderful guests to, uh, to your radio. Um, last week, if you recall, uh, we had uh, uh, a, a set of guests on, um, Gabriella Watson, who is a uh, adjunct professor at uh, Temple University. Uh, she is a documentary filmmaker, an independent producer, and an educator. Um, and then we heard from House of Hamill, and we did say that we would be offering two of their CDs, um, House of Hamill, uh, wide awake, and we got them autographed along with two tickets uh, to go along with each of those CDs for the Sheila E. concert coming up at the Dell. So I don't know, Irish folk rock and uh, Sheila E., put them together, what do you get? I don't know, but uh, you can win that combo. Um, and uh, we also learned that you can learn to play the guitar for free or for a dollar a month from Robert Swift. Uh, at Swift Guitar Lessons, learning guitar online, really at your convenience, um, and uh, just uh, really a fantastic guy. By the way, uh, you know, I am uh, friends with Rob, and uh, congratulations to him. He won, I think, a, uh, a silver or gold medal at the uh, Naga Jiu-Jitsu Tournament, so uh, he does put his fingers at risk doing jiu-jitsu in addition to playing the guitar. Um, let me uh, start uh, right now with... Um, Professor Craig Green. Uh, he is a very distinguished professor. Um, he has got quite a uh, uh, you know, great background in terms of his uh, education. He received his uh, Bachelor's of Science from Wake Forest University, his Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School. He received his uh, Master's in, uh, from uh, Princeton University and is working on his Ph.D., uh, he has won numerous awards for outstanding scholarship, distinguished teaching, outstanding professor of the year at Temple University Beasley School of Law. Uh, in addition to uh, the other types of work that he has done, he's been uh, interviewed on radio, television, and many other things. And so our question, because we only have a limited time to go through this, our question for uh, Professor Green is, what is going on in today's Supreme Court? And let me just put that within context. Um, for so many, uh, you know, it's been kind of, uh, you know, um, a quiet on, on, you know, I don't hear that much about the Supreme Court. 
as opposed to back in the 60s during the civil rights era and all that stuff. But um, today, there's just a lot of things going on. You've heard about it in the news, you know, travel ban, and then, you know, the court says no, and then the court says something else, and then there's a the whole thing going on with the, the uh, your privacy rights and uh, so many other issues. And then it just seems like uh, things have become more polarized these days in terms of far left, far right, uh, getting uh, justices on the Supreme Court. And so what is going on today in terms of uh, our, our country? And we understand that this, the, the court systems, the courts and, and the Supreme Court in particular, has uh, an ability to limit the role of even the president of the United States. And that court may be changing. And so with that, Professor Green, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here. And uh, I guess just to jump right into it, you know, people may or may not think about the court's uh, all the time and every day. But, you know, you think about Philadelphia, you go to Independence Hall or the Constitution Center or whatever, the things that make the Constitution real for people in America 21st century, it's largely the Supreme Court that does it. So that's the first thing to say is that the courts really serve as a, a counterbalance in some ways to uh, real big political transitions, and that's exactly what we're in the middle of now. Second thing about the Supreme Court right now, maybe for the last 30 years, people have taken for granted the court has been sort of, you know, for, for experts anyway, has been largely divided roughly five to four vote. And uh, that, that's that been true for about 30 years. Mm, that, that's very close, five to four. That's right. And so all the most important issues of the day, uh, even in the 21st century, almost all the issues of the day, they go to the Supreme Court. Mm. So you have cases like the travel ban, which is on the way there. People forget, but, you know, Republicans were unable to repeal Obamacare. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of Obamacare twice. If they voted the other way, they wouldn't have had to repeal it. It would have been struck down. Uh, of course, LGBT rights and same-sex marriage, uh, issues of racial diversity in education, issues of racial justice in law enforcement, all of these things have come before the Supreme Court time and time again. It's five to four, nice edge sort of balance between liberal, relatively liberal justices relatively conservative justice. What's happening today? What's happening today is, uh, of course, Donald Trump and Senate Republicans uh, delayed the appointment of a Supreme Court justice for a full year in order to promise that they would have a stalwart conservative justice that they could really deliver for their political base. And that's exactly what they did. They delayed the nomination of, and then uh, put in uh, Neil Gorsuch, uh, who is now a very conservative one of the most conservative members of the court. Uh, that's said and done, but I think the really important thing for people to know is that the middle of that five to four split, Justice Kennedy, the middle justice, that guy is probably going to resign this year. Mm. And uh, President Trump and Senate Republicans will have the opportunity to appoint another equally or even more conservative justice that I think will shift the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in court cases uh, more than any time in the last probably 70 years. So when you say that, right now there are people who are saying yes, and people are saying oh no. Uh, what's happening uh, in terms of like uh, the politics in our country that that is 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 uh, more and more polarized as the Supreme Court has got to make these decisions? Sure. In the immediate sense, I mean, the delay of uh, Chief Judge Merrick Garland's nomination, that had never happened before. Uh, and it made people very, very upset. Uh, the idea of having an eight-justice court for a full year never happened before. That really politicized things. And another thing is that I think uh, people understand, politicians understand, how much the court matters. The only uh, promise that President Trump has clearly delivered on is Neil Gorsuch. That is the only promise. And I think that's exactly what a, a large number of conservatives and liberals uh, really value the issues. You know, think, think of that list again, the travel ban, executive power, torture in Guantanamo, uh, 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 LGBT rights, you know, all of the hot button issues and a large number of hot button issues that divide the country politically. Well, those, those cases also go to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in earlier times, I think it may be fair to say, was a little less polarized, maybe like the, you know, the Senate or any other number of political institutions. But I think that, that in the last year or so, maybe two, um, I think more of the gloves have come off, more of the knuckles have turned brass, uh, and I think that people are really fighting uh, for the values of the Constitution that are going to be decided by the Supreme Court you know, for the next probably 20 years. 
Let me uh, ask you this, and, and let me start with this example. You know, I posted on Facebook, um, you know, uh, that uh, I was meeting with and happy to meet with some international students, uh, young leaders from uh, the Middle East, Turkey, uh, Iran, other other places, and uh, some some nice person, you know, they put a little angry face on my on my post, and and I think probably because they felt that hey, you know, um, these people are Muslims, they're anti-U.S., they're they're probably not Christians or whatever is going on, and 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 so it it just to me is an example of how people can react on the surface, make a decision without knowing deeply, you know, what what the issues are. And and so whether people like or don't like, you know, a, a certain issue, uh, let me take the, the travel ban. Could you break that down from a legal perspective, not, not from like an opinion, like a lot of people have opinions, but just in terms of the courts and what are the, the constitutional issues that are involved in the travel ban? Sure. So one thing, just to, just to stress this point about the court, I mean, uh, we live in a country – where a court interpreting a constitution can stand up to a president and say no. And that really is, relative to some of the other countries you mentioned, some of the countries around the world, that's a really peculiar and, and, and quite frankly, sometimes marvelous thing about America, is that that, that will be decided uh, by people who hear the arguments um, and appeal to the law. What's mm-hmm. the legal issue? Uh, in one sense, I think, you know, just for simple terms, that uh, the, the the issue in some ways is uh, whether the travel ban is it has any connection to religious discrimination or violations of equality, treating people differently from different countries based on the religion, the dominant religion of those countries. Yeah, but why is that important when we're talking about people who aren't American citizens? They're not even U.S. citizens. Sure. Well, of course, there are a lot of rights that non-U.S. citizens have, uh, and there are a lot of uh, rights that affect uh, presidential policy, but the the legal issue the Supreme Court is going to decide. I, I think that you know most people believe that if uh, if President Trump had had said uh, we're only going to admit, for example, uh, non-Muslim people, if that had been literally a Muslim ban, if he, if that had been the executive order, I think that would have been unconstitutional. And most people agree about that. The order isn't written that way, at least not the revised version. The revised version tries to be more subtle. Whatever you might read on his Twitter account. The revised version tries to be more subtle about it, and so the court confronts this really hard question. Mm. Should they interpret the travel ban like it's written by their DOJ lawyers in the sort of passivity of an office, or should they interpret it like the president says it actually is, which is religious discrimination? I think that's a very, very hard question. It affects a lot about presidential power. Uh, you know, no Congress, no statute uh, travel ban. This is all just an executive order designed by the president himself. And does the Constitution have anything to say about the type of immigration type of people we allow into the country? Um, or is that just a matter of presidential discretion to do whatever he wants, including perhaps uh, under the table religious discrimination? That's a very, very hard case. It matters everything. Who are the justices who decide that? Uh, so the ability to appoint another justice, for example, could absolutely change the result in that case. It is very hard to know. Could we go a little bit fundamental? Because there's probably some people scratching their heads right now saying, but Professor, I don't really understand what the problem is because the president's the president's and uh, the president is making a decision for the safety of the country and he's in charge of immigration. And again, the Constitution, isn't that about Americans? Why does the Constitution to extend to citizens of other countries that are, that are not even U.S. citizens? Sure. Well, I mean, one thing to say, and this is something that, you know, I think uh, really is fundamental, is that, of course, there are lots of non-citizens in the United States who have lots of constitutional rights. Nobody thinks that when a non-citizen gets arrested by the cops, they don't have, you know, Miranda rights, you know, or the right to have counsel or something like this. Nobody thinks that non-citizens in the U.S. don't have First Amendment rights. Now, this this travel ban, though, goes a little farther than that because, of course, dealing with non-U.S. citizens who are not located within the United States. And so I think that there, there are two things about that. One is the constitutional issue, whether religious discrimination is religious discrimination anyway. And another is that there are statutes of by Congress that forbid various kinds of discrimination, and does the president has the president violated those? So there are these legal cons- or there could be these there's argued to be these legal constraints, uh, as there are many cases there are of how the American government treats people who are not American citizens. And I think that part of things some of those are very well established. Uh, 
I'm going to put you on a hot spot. What, what would happen if the court went a certain way and said, um, yes, uh, we can uh, have this travel ban, let's do all these things? And what would happen if the court went the other way and said, oh, no, no, that's discrimination of peoples. It violates our our constitution, or the values that we have. How, how would those two very different results affect our country? Yeah, I think uh, there are a couple things I'd want to say real quick. One of them is on this question of discrimination. I think uh, the travel ban has been interpreted around the world uh, as a signal of what America stands for in the age of Trump. And I think there may be benefits to that, but there are certainly costs. Uh, And America is seen right or wrong as a welcoming place, a place of religious toleration, again, all the way back to to Philadelphia Independence Hall and beyond. Uh, So I think that aspect, it's a really dramatic symbol of what America stands for, what the legal order stands for, how we're perceived for other countries, um, how we stand up to our international law responsibilities. Sure, there's that. But the other thing is this claim about keeping America safe. Um, The DOJ lawyers, the Department of Justice lawyers, the government lawyers have had a terribly hard time explaining how this 90 or 120 day restriction on admittees of of uh, uh, of uh, my immigrants from six countries is actually going to keep the country safe. Um, it's a very hard explanation to offer. There's not very much information or data the government has been able to put forward of any actual concrete risk, as opposed to just a political promise. Any actual risk that justifies that kind of national security restriction. Now there are justices on the court today, uh, including Neil Gorsuch who have basically taken the president's word for it. He says, trust us. They say, how far? Sounds good to us. And I think this second aspect of how much do you trust the president whenever he waves the label national security to do whatever doesn't seem necessarily like a very rational policy, but do whatever he wants to do. You know, that kind of approach, the approach of trusting the president whenever they wave the national security flag, that was very troublesome after 9-11 for people who remember that. And it's super troublesome when you think back to World War II, and uh, that principle underlay Japanese internment, of course, back in uh, the 1940s. So I think that is a second area. One is this idea of religious determination, what does America stand for? And the second is this balance of power and how much the president gets to decide on his own and with no judicial supervision what it is that's going to keep America safe. And I have to tell you that there have been people in the past who have been worried about that and thought that courts should be checking a little bit of the homework and that America's separation of powers works better when the courts step in and and demand some sort of explanation, some sort of plausibility to the idea that this kind of policy is so deviant from some views of American traditions, that this kind of policy actually would keep America safe. It's hard to see. In the the time this travel ban, as everybody knows, maybe it's been on, on hold for months, and there hasn't been any concrete adverse effect on national security. While it's been on hold, while the lower courts have put injunctions and put stays and kept it from coming into effect, what has happened? And the answer is a big nothing uh, so far. Uh, of course, the president continues to make the same arguments uh, with, with absolutely no remorse or shame about it. Uh, yes, now it's important. Uh, but I think, the, you know, I think the, court, if they, if the court accepts the president's arguments. I think it's a real step in a different direction in terms of trusting the president uh, and maybe abdicating some level of, of real legalism uh, and, uh, and some sort of checks and balances and separation of powers in a very important area of national security. Mm. Let me just uh, let our listeners know that uh, Professor uh, Craig Green did uh, serve in the Department of Justice, so in fact he worked there at DOJ. Um, and 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 let me ask you this: I mean, so with all that's been going on, um, we've got the, a, a new Supreme Court Justice uh, Gorsuch, uh, and we might be looking at yet another one with all these changes that have happened somewhat recently, I think. Um, how would you define today's Supreme Court, and what are we looking at for tomorrow's Supreme Court? Yeah, I think um, I think today's Supreme Court, um, with Gorsuch as a very conservative justice replacing uh, Justice Scalia, who was also a very conservative justice, uh, I think right now people who watch the court, who study the court, um, it's somewhere between holding their breath and 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 watching um, watching the inevitable happen. Um, I think that. Uh, on issues of racial justice or LGBT rights um, uh, or uh, national security rights or the travel ban. Uh, I think that uh, the replacement of Justice Kennedy, which I think is very, very likely next year, by Donald Trump, by someone who's likely to be 
at least as conservative, maybe more conservative than Justice Gorsuch, it will really shift the course of American law, and particularly American constitutional law, in a very conservative direction, which is what the president promised to do and what the election results of his winning produced. So that's a, you know, I, I, I did work for the Department of Justice under the Bush administration, and that was another very controversial election, and uh, the Republican candidate won the presidency, and that had very profound effects on how the court moved. But I think this time it's different. I think this time with Justice Kennedy as the knife's edge, fifth vote, getting replaced, I think we're going to see changes on the court and in constitutional law that we haven't seen in many decades. With uh, some new technology that has uh, affected the entire world, uh, cyber terrorism and all those type of things, these new issues now coming in front of the, this court, how do you see that? Uh, and, and, for example, my privacy, how is that going to turn out? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a very interesting question, and that is an area where the court really has to share the field uh, with uh, other uh, policymakers. So uh, cyber terrorism, for example, uh, the most important issue today is interference with elections. That's not going to be decided by the court. That will be decided by how this administration uh, and Congress uh, decide to try to protect the ballot box. Um, in turn, some of the issues you mentioned in terms of privacy, those things are so important with respect not just to sort of cyber terrorism or this sort of stuff, but police technologies. And I think an idea of having a court that uh, that protects privacy rights um, relative to important and very, uh, very important uh, police uh, technologies, I think is going to be another thing that comes before the court. And, and the same thing applies, which is who sits on the court uh, affects the kinds of results that come out of the court. And, and, and I think there's just no question uh, that uh, the Trump presidency and the Republicans, particularly in the Senate, uh, almost dictate uh, that there's going to be a real shift to the right in terms of privacy and in terms of those new technologies, uh, I think one can expect a, a, real, a real move in that direction. Have you, uh, over the last couple of years, um, really noted uh, some surprising decisions from the, the Supreme Court? Yes, uh, a lot of surprising decisions. Uh, let me mention two that I think uh, that I think I've been surprised about, and one of them maybe uh, for, for some number of your listeners may be a positive decision. I think the the same-sex marriage decision by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, had an enormous effect on the politics and on the media and on the culture and the rest of it. And I think that w that was a long time coming in a sense, but it also still felt a little like a surprise. I have to say, for for me anyway, um, Justice Kennedy was the fifth vote on that decision. Mm, okay. And, uh, you know, I think for people who'd watched him for a long time, it wasn't clear he was going to go that far. Well, he did. And so did the court, and so did the country. On the other hand, there's a case that uh, about the same time, a little bit earlier, um, where the Supreme Court really restricted the application of the Voting Rights Act um, of 1965, uh, areas in which the Supreme Court and the Congress and the Department of Justice had all worked together to try to make sure that African Americans in particular and racial minorities more generally were not being disenfranchised and cut out of the ballot box. Um, these branches working together, the Supreme Court struck it down uh, in large part and really weakened the protections for voting in the country uh, and licensed um, uh, uh, policymakers at the state and local level to cut people out of, the, out of the ballot box and cut people out of the democracy and cut people out of we the people. And I thought that was a shocking decision for me. I, I never would have expected it. Um, and so I think this is the sort of thing that it's true. A lot of the stuff operates under the radar, but I guess my, my sort of message is that I, I think these kinds of decisions really do shape uh, the way the country works uh, on Election Day, uh, in our private lives, um, and in terms of our interaction with the government. And I, I just think the court, uh, it's my, my, sort of my professional guild or whatever, I, I focus on the court all the time, but I really think that, um, that America, it's a, the courts as an institution, the court decisions the court makes uh, have such an impact on the way everything else works around here. We are anticipating some interesting new cases. For example, um, the the whole issue, however people feel about sanctuary cities, I understand that's uh, there's a lawsuit there. And uh, then there's uh, a number of ethics issues uh, about, uh, you know, the, uh, the the president and his uh, family members uh, and, and uh, what are their limitations and what are they supposed to be transparent about. 
Uh, is that coming on deck or is that just kind of floating out in the atmosphere? I think the ones that are really on deck are there's a case about the ability of a cake maker uh, to, to refuse to serve um, a same-sex uh, wedding. And so that's one case that's really coming along that's a really big deal case. The case you mentioned about sanctuary cities is, it also very well may make it to the Supreme Court. Um, uh, the, the issue there really is about how much money can the federal government punish cities for taking a policy they don't like. And maybe the irony of it or whatever else is that the, um, the, the dominant case for that, for that principle is actually the Obamacare decision that Chief Justice Roberts wrote just a couple years ago. Um, and the message was, you know, that if you, don't do, if you don't do the immigration policy the federal government wants, then maybe the federal government doesn't pay your immigration money. But they can't pull your Medicaid, and they can't pull your education funding, and they can't bankrupt your city or your state because you're not doing one thing that they want you to do. And I think that, too, I mean, it, if the government continues to fight it, and it could conceivably go to the Supreme Court. Um, and I think that also, you know, if, if that case were to go and just to sort of uh, to spell it out in terms of speculation, if that case were to go to the president, then there would be an enormous amount of power for Congress to boss around states and cities on just about everything. Because any time you did anything the federal government didn't want, they'd say, oh, we'll take all your money away. Uh, and so I think it's not it's bigger in some ways, although the sanctuary city issue is very big. It matters a, a heck of a lot for the economies and the societies of, um, of uh, cities and the, and the functionality of police force, of course, too. Mm-hmm. But it's even bigger than that. It's about uh, the extent to which the federal government – uh, can boss around states and local government. And the irony is, maybe if you want, is that these are folks who are always talking about small federal governments, but not when limit, it comes to the role of government. Sure. Only sometimes. Only sometimes. And it's true that that could give rise to a constitutional issue down the road. It could come in front of the Supreme Court. Yeah, it's very interesting as we look to the future that America may not be the America that we're used to. You know, it may shift this way or that way. It's looking like a certain, uh, going in a certain direction. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, maybe in the future people will be more attuned to what's happening in the Supreme Court and the courts around them as there is this clash between what uh, polarized America wants, who they elect, and what they try to do, and the courts are right there. Hopefully it will be that third branch of government, but, of course, you know, they get appointed and we see which way they go. So true. Well, Professor, thank you for joining us and sharing all that knowledge. I'll ask our listeners to stay tuned because we'll be right back with Renee Wall, who will be telling us about her songwriting and we'll be listening to some of her music. All right, we are back. This is Councilman David O. You are in the know with David O. We were just listening to uh, Professor Craig Green. Do you feel like going to law school now? Certainly not boring, right? Very interesting. Fascinating stuff. You know, I just think uh, knowledge can be so entertaining. Um, speaking of which, uh, we had on our show last week a Irish uh, folk rock group, House of Hamill, the violin, the guitar, great lyrics. And uh, they were so kind to uh, autograph uh, a couple of their CDs, House of Hamill, Wide Awake. And uh, so what we're going to do is this. If you want to win this along with two tickets, so we got two prizes, one CD for each person, two CDs, two prizes. But they come along with two tickets to see Sheila E. at the Dell Center. Rain or Shine event. Doors open at 6 p.m. Uh, Thursday, August 17th. Uh, show begins at 7 o'clock. So two tickets, one CD. Uh, what you have to do is you have to think of a number between 1 and uh, 500. 1 and 500. And e, uh, just uh, send me an email, David O. Show, ra- David O. Radio Show at gmail.com. David O. Two letters, O-H, Radio Show at gmail.com. Um, listen, if you throw in a funny joke, if your number is like, you know, kind of like borderline, the funny joke gets the prize. And we'll announce it next week, Tuesday, 2 to 3, um, here on In the Know with David O. WWDB, 860 AM. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, um, August the 17th, same day, Thursday, First Responder Appreciation Day here in Philadelphia. So, you know, our, our first responders, police officers, firefighters, emergency medical folks have uh, such a tough job, and it would be so uplifting for folks just to say thank you. I know, uh, I know I'm l- l- looking at Renee. I know our service members really appreciate when someone says thank you. And by, way, by the way, so do your council members. <laughs> you know, people say thank you. It goes a long way. Uh, and so let's keep our first responders uh, in mind. 
But right now, let me uh, introduce Renee through a clip from uh, one from her CD, one of her CDs. Uh, this song is called "See You on the Way Down." First touch, first kiss. There is nothing that feels like this. Your breath on my skin. Beautiful music from uh, Renee, uh, Renee Wall, um, and uh, she uh, she is uh, from Harrisburg originally. Yes. Spent time in Philly, went to Temple University, and uh, you know, just to let you know, she uh, is uh, she served in the U.S. Air Force. She had top secret clearance and uh, was a captain in the Air Force assigned yes. to NSA. Yes. So, so you know, she's. Uh, Listening to our discussion yes, with absolutely. Professor uh, Craig <laughs> oh, Green here. No, 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 <laughs> joking is allowed. Uh, got her undergraduate uh, degree uh, in physics and uh, her master's in aeronautics. And uh, here she is, uh, a country music singer, huh? Right. Yes, absolutely. From from point A to point B, just a just an yeah. interesting path there. But, but it's interesting because all of that, I suppose, it just adds a lot of a uh, 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 breath to your it, songwriting. It certainly does. I mean, you, any experience that you have in life adds to being able to to write a lyric, write an expression of what you went through. And also the ability to understand what other people are going through to a certain extent and write about that. So, yeah, no, I mean, there's it, every experience that I've had has helped me get to the point where I am now and, and to be, I think, a better songwriter because mm. of that. And, and uh, you know, um, one of the things uh, that, that, that you've done is kind of kind of defined your music in a certain way. How would you describe it? Uh, we, we're actually coining a new term. Hopefully nobody else has used this before, but uh, we'll go with country roots noir. Country yes. roots noir. Yes, the, ly- the lyrical topics tend to be a little on the darker side. Yes, and, you yes. know, we, we were having this conversation beforehand uh, in the room uh, with Justin about folk music and how there is a stereotype. There's this, you know, this preconceived notion of what a certain genre is. But you know, you say country, people think of you one way. You say folk, you get another uh, stereotype thrown at you. And uh, a lot of times we use Americana or roots rock or alternative right. country. So there's this mixture of country, blues, a little bit of blues in there. Um, and it, but it's all lyric driven. Mm. It really is. There may be some pop aspects to the song structure. Right, right. But so, you know, make it interesting for people because, you, you know, really you're making music for other people. You're making it for yourself, but you really want to, to reach out and be able to touch somebody with that music. Um, so I think that's where the genres can can be a little deceiving and, and maybe not tell the whole the whole story. So we're going with country roots noir. Mm, I like it. <laughs> I like it. There is a like a noir film festival. I always have trouble saying that word. Noir, noir. 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 Oh come on. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> but I understand it to be like an uh, something that leads to like a bad decision that mm. leads to another thing that leads to on a downward spiral. Pretty much, yes. That's As, what it's oh, all about. Oh my goodness. All right, so. <laughs> So, so you know, uh, people can experience your music uh, this Thursday, right? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to be at the Grape Room at eight o'clock. So uh, my drummer and I, David Strayer, will be mm-hmm. there as a duo. 
And, uh, yeah, please come out. We'd love to see you. Yeah, the, the Say you saw in, uh, us. On, on Grape Street it's in Maniac. Maniac. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if people want to, you know, kind of learn more about you um, and uh, also check out your music, yes. uh, do you have a website to tell folks? I do. It's ReneeWall.com. And, of course, my last name is spelled W-A-H-L. Unfortunately, for the people not in the studio, you can't see it written on my guitar. I make it easier for people <laughs> yeah. to know how to spell it. But it's R-E-N-E-E-W-A-H-L. And from there, of course, they can get show dates and they can get uh, links to Amazon Music, iTunes, all of that. And they can actually purchase some of the music right there on the website. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you're going to perform mm-hmm. with, with Dave, your drummer. Yes. Uh, one of your original songs. Yes. And uh, this is uh, Whiskey Smells Like Bad Decisions. Yes, of course, because we have to keep with the theme. I'm going to stand up for this just so you can get a little bit of the guitar. Okay. And hopefully we'll do it that way. Oh, what? Of course, there's a big old truck. Is it a truck? Yeah, I don't know. It might be an airplane. I <laughs> know. Okay, we're good. <laughs> really? Right here, we're good. All okay, right. great. So this is called Whiskey Smells Like Bad Decisions. And just a, a quick ca- uh, caveat on the, the working for the NSA. When we were thinking of a band name, uh, my manager, Rodney, we came up with Sworn Secrets. There you so go. it's Renee Wall and the Sworn Secrets. And the uh, the EP that introduces that is called Sworn Secrets. So if you like that, this is the, the first track we heard is the first track on the EP, and this is the last track. All right. Thank you. Hi. Been careful not to think about you. I keep the door locked on the cabinet in the cellar. Cause I know that if I didn't, I'd keep drinking and my tears would keep falling. And I'd end up in some stranger's room, drowning memories of you.
All right, Renee Wall. Check her out this Thursday at the Great Room in Maniunk. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, and we are back. Uh, listen, we were uh, totally uh, entertained by uh, Renee Wall and Sworn Secrets. She's got one of her secrets here, uh, her drummer, Dave. And uh, But you can find uh, her at the Grape Room uh, this Thursday. What time, Renee? Yes, we're on at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Be sure you're there. You know, she's traveled a long way from Nashville. She's, uh, she's here to perform, and you'll be happy to catch her there. And, of course, we were uh, listening to... Uh, Professor Craig Green telling us about the importance of the Supreme Court and how it is changing and how we may really be uh, more and more attuned to what is going on uh, with our Supreme Court. But now let me introduce uh, Justin Nordell. He is the executive director of the Philadelphia Folk Song Society. Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, David. Oh, perfect. Listen, uh, you are uh, someone who kind of grew up with the Folk Festival. Is that right? That is correct. My parents met at the Philadelphia Folk Festival. Wow. Um, in fact, my mother met all four of her husbands at the oh, Philadelphia Folk goodness. Festival. Oh, my goodness. Uh-oh. So, single ladies, come on down. Uh-oh. Well, I don't know. Maybe I should go. <laughs> I, I should check it out. No, but, but you know, we were just talking about that, like how it's uh, such a significant uh, event. I mean, the Philadelphia Folk Festival in its 56th year, just the world-renowned festival. It's it's really amazing because I'll go to international uh, events and, and music conferences mm-hmm. and meet musicians from all over the world that have heard of Philadelphia Folk Festival, um, but then I'll walk down the street in Philly and tell people about it, and they'll say, wait, what? Where? Here? Really? Yeah. So it's uh, it's always astounded me that, um, you know, it's such a, a paramount event in uh, the music world and in the folk world, but in Philadelphia, it's, it's definitely become uh, kind of a hidden gem that we really wish more people knew about. Well, you could tell them about it right now because it's coming up, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It's going to be August 17th through the 20th. Um, and while we're the Philadelphia Folk Festival, we're right outside of Philadelphia in Upper Salford Township. That's in Montgomery County. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can take the Turnpike or Septa to the Lansdale Exeter Station. And it's just a couple miles from there. And uh, we are going strong for 56 years now. We're yes. the oldest continuously run outdoor music festival in all of North America. And some really big names, and one of them I recognize, Graham Nash, right? <laughs> Crosby, Stills, and Nash? Yep, we've got Graham Nash coming this year, as well as uh, wow. our friends Old Crow Medicine Show off mm-hmm. of their Grammy yes. win. Wow. Uh, we've got some astounding uh, new talents, Sierra Hall and Samantha Fish, who've been really um, blazing the way both in Americana and blues. And then we've got Taj Mahal and Keb Mo, two absolutely astounding talents who are actually mm. playing together, uh, wow. just recorded an album together for the first time. Time and we are so excited to have them there. Yeah, that, that's really exciting. And, and I was looking at this highlighted name in my notes, Eric Anderson, who wrote songs for Johnny Cash, Bob Dylan, The Grateful Dead. Yep, and that's the thing is that we have so many songwriters um, and so many performers that you don't know that you know. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, Larry Campbell and Teresa Williams, who've played with Dylan since, oh gosh, probably the 60s, and have been doing all sorts of incredible uh, music, both on their own and with some of the most outstanding talents uh, in the industry. Yeah, I, you know, I've heard from people what a great time it is. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, like Friday through Sunday, and you said 35,000 people roll through there? Yeah, we have about 35,000 cumulative people that come over mm. the course of the weekend, and then we actually have about seven to 8,000 that actually camp and stay on site for the entirety of the festival. We're on an 83-acre farm, and so there's plenty of room for the entire family. Well, what's not to love about that? (laughs) Uh, How much does it cost to get into this? A great question. We've got a number of different ticket prices and levels. If you're going to come for the day or if you're going to come for the whole weekend, ranging from 10 bucks for the kids to if you want to come for the whole shebang and camp, it's about 260. Wow. Okay. Well, listen. Where do people go? A website, you know, in order to get those tickets, uh, find out what who's playing. Uh, what the schedule is. Uh, if you just go to folkfest.org mm-hmm. um, or the Philadelphia Folk Song Society's website, pfs.org, that's paulfranksam.org, you can find everything from uh, the full schedule, the full lineup, <coughs> see a lot of incredible local acts playing there as well. Um, we pride ourselves on booking some of the best talents in Philadelphia. Yeah, you know, uh, 
I was uh, just talking to some of my friends, just telling them about, because PHL Live is coming up, that, uh, you know, one of the most surprising genres for me, not that, not that I'm a music expert, was a country folk genre, and how much I love that uh, that entire show. Every year, country folk is like one of the best, uh, you know, venues to go to, and, um you know, folk music is oftentimes misunderstood by people because it's not, you know, people think they know country, they know hip-hop, they know rap, they know rock. Uh, how would you describe folk music? <laughs> well, I, I jokingly say because of the preconceived notions that, that folk is just another four-letter F word mm. uh, because a lot of people hear folk and they have kind of this, oh, it's going to be a white guy with a guitar on his day. And we've got plenty of those. But yeah. uh, we also have an outstanding number of, of talents from all sorts of subgenres because because um, folk is really about storytelling um, of a time or a place. And, and Philadelphia has always been known for its songwriting. Um, and under that kind of umbrella term of folk, um, singer-songwriters, hip-hop, country, rap, all of those are forms of folk music. Mm. And so we've really um, strived to have all of those subgenres represented at the Philadelphia Folk Festival. And we've got 111 acts on wow. eight stages wow, over four nights and three days. So there's a little of something for everyone. And then uh, we actually now have our very own venue for the first time in our 60-year history in Roxborough uh, that we just are opening up at 6156 Ridge Avenue uh, in Roxborough, PA. So come check out some folk music all year long, and you'll hear that it's uh, not not your grandpappy's folk music no, it, anymore. No, it, it sure isn't. I mean, uh, I really enjoyed the music. And for those you know who may not have really thought about the category folk music like as one to go, I mean, just a wide variety of uh, instruments, music, uh, some of it really kind of rocking, you know, the electric guitars going, um, you know, just really, really uh, outstanding music. A lot of fun, too. Absolutely, and it's something that, again, I'm biased. I was brought up on, um, and it's something that's always been a, a part of, of my musical heritage, but um, it's something that so many people find so many different things to connect to. Um, again, it's all about the, the musicality, and it's all about the, the songwriting, so just an outstanding uh, genre that I don't think it's a, enough credit that it deserves. So I'm hoping mm. a lot more people will come check us out in Roxburgh and will come visit us at the 56th Annual Philadelphia Folk Festival. Again, that's running August 17th through the 20th, uh, right up in Upper South Ford Township, Pennsylvania. Oh, perfect. Now, a little bit about you, because uh, you have got this very interesting background <laughs> in the arts. While you grew up at the feet of whatever the folk festival, you've also uh, been... Uh, uh, with the Film Society, the Pennsylvania Ballet, Funimation, um, you know, the, the uh, what else? Uh, the uh, I, I like to describe myself as culturally promiscuous. Yeah, um, that's a good way to put it. Which yeah. I honestly think is what the average Philadelphian is. You, there mm. isn't someone in Philadelphia that is just an art museum subscriber. Right, right, right. We, you know, we, we're art museum subscribers, we're opera subscribers, we're ballet subscribers, we're members of the Folk Song Society, members of the Film Society. Society, members of the Clef Club, we are going out because Philadelphia is such an incredible art city that there's always something to do. So it's definitely something that I've grown very passionate about in my career here in the uh, Philadelphia nonprofit art spectrum, and I'm really happy to bring it all home to the Philadelphia Folk Song Society as we're, again, opening up our own venue and music school mm, in Roxborough and continuing wow. traditions here uh, at the Philadelphia Folk Festival. So with that background, what do you see for the future of the organization and for the Folk Festival? That's a, a great question, David. The Philadelphia Folk Song Society began within the last couple of years working with local musicians to do professional development work. It's not necessarily, you know, oh, this is how you play this chord, but it's this is how you make the most money off your taxes. Um, this is why you'll never get booked at that venue again. This mm -hmm. is, you know, the things that you can be doing to route yourself um, better. These kind of professional development things yes. that are kind of these industry secrets that you kind of have to know people to, to be able to uh, to kind of get the inner knowledge. We've developed something called the Philadelphia Music Co-op, um, which is an outstanding consortium of musicians wow. here in Philadelphia that we work with year-round. And so really utilizing the co-op to both showcase what Philadelphia has to offer musically as well as making sure that they're on the path to be the best uh, performers representing Philadelphia nationally and internationally. Well, that's news to me. 
and exciting news. I, I certainly invite all our listeners to check out the Philadelphia Folk Song uh, Society and all the work that you're doing. Clearly, you know, uh, set aside some time, you know, for August 17th through the 20th uh, for the big, dynamic uh, Philadelphia Folk uh, Festival, uh, internationally known, and you could uh, partake just a few minutes' drive. Um, okay, so listen, uh, everyone, again, if you are interested in winning those autographed House of Hamill CDs uh, and the Sheila E. tickets, go to David O. Radio Show at gmail.com. Give me a number, 1 through 500, and throw in a funny joke, and they are yours. We'll announce it on our show next week, uh, next Tuesday, 2 to 3, right here on this show. You've been listening to In the Know with David O. on 860 AM WWDB. Tune in again next Tuesday at 2 p.m. for more informative, substantive, intelligent talk radio with Philadelphia Councilman David O.